This is BBC Three, where Alice and her six dads is next. First, though, it's Lucas Johnson and all his murders in an EastEnders special. There's one type of EastEnders story that gets everybody talking. It's been a murder. Your father is dead. Did you say murder in class? You killed my husband. You should have killed someone. That is murder. It was an accident. The man is dead. Tonight, we go behind the scenes when the secrets of Walford's deadliest killer are revealed. And look at what makes the perfect EastEnders murder. You might as well go out with a bang. Somebody needs to be silenced now. The shock, the horror, the fear. It's the way it's written, the way it's acted. Pure EastEnders at its best. All the classic ingredients. Great intrigue. Jeopardy. Guilt. People really are on the edge of their seats. Dark, Dickensian. Ordinary characters pushed to extremes. Hopefully you're scared. It's terrific viewing. That's where it's exciting. It's the hunter and the hunted. The one thing that you really shouldn't do. Murder. There's always a cliffhanger. He was asking for it. He kind of wanted him dead. Their life is in danger. <gasps> it's just all jolly good fun, really. Lucas Johnson first hit our screens in April 2008. Here we go, take two. For two years, he's been making headlines with his devilish deeds. Now, with the blood of three people on his hands and one very suspicious doggy disappearance, Lucas has become officially the most dangerous man ever to roam the streets of Walford. Lucas tried intensely to do the right thing, but he just had the intensely wrong ideas to go about achieving that. On one hand, you've got this preacher, this man of God, who's, who's turned to religion to kind of to flee his old life. Treat every stranger like a friend. Yeah. It's all a bit of a front, and he's using it as a, as a, as a smokescreen to get away with activities that are far worse than anything he used to get up to. You've got five minutes. <laughs> with the Lucas story, we decided actually to play a storyline where the audience follows the murderer. They, they know more than the characters. He was living this so-called Christian life that was superior to everybody else's in the square. And nobody knew the rot that, that lay beneath. He didn't see himself as a bad person. Uh, he did it all for the greater good. There was a bigger picture. Oh, I see a disciple of Satan. That's what I see. He's not a Cormano Garden serial killer. He's a man who's done it for reasons that he can condone. When he was young, he'd be in this really violent, wayward, drug-dealing kind of psycho. Go near Chelsea again, and I'll kill you. The story with him was always going to be bad boy trying to change his ways. Can you ever change who you are? You really don't know what you're dealing with. That old part of him has been buried away. He thinks it's dead. He tells himself it's dead, but deep down it's still there. And so that when he actually finds himself in a situation where he is pushed to the limits and kills someone, there's that part of him comes out and is still very much alive. We all have sides. We keep hidden from those closest to us. Trina reopened that dark part of Lucas. He's kind of repressed sexual feelings, his repressed violence it kind of came out with Trina. You still want me, Lucas. When Trina represented to us the devil or the temptress. You're mine. And to Lucas, he had to stop that by bashing her against the rake. No! <laughs> Suddenly, you're throwing this really dark secret into the story, and you've got Lucas trying to hold his marriage together, trying to not kill again. But that wasn't to be. Lucas's misguided interpretation of the Bible leads him to his next victim. My arrows will be drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh. Cue Denise's ex-husband, Owen. You need help, mate. He's reciting all this religious stuff, and actually what he's kind of doing, he's kind of justifying his own kind of homicidal urges while he's actually doing it. And what have you done with the door? He done. At that point, Lucas is thinking, don't cross me, because I'm doing God's work. It wasn't your usual 
killing spree. His methods and his reasons for killing sets him apart from other killers and murderers. All his guilt and fear and pain it was all part of God's plan. You're kind of with someone sharing their everyday life and seeing how his mind works in great detail over a prolonged period of time. And that's something that EastEnders doesn't usually do. <laughs> Lucas will really, really be missed, actually, because he's, a, he's such an individual and he's so different to any other character. Lucas has secured himself a spot in the Walford Murderers Hall of Fame. But let's face it, Albert Square is no stranger to Murder Most Horrid. In fact, there has been a grand total of 17 in the show's 25-year history. But what do you need to create the perfect EastEnders murder? The more iconic the either the location or the timing is, then the, the more memorable the murder storyline becomes. There will always be something happy going alongside something really dark. With Owen's death, uh, it was Lucas's wedding day, and you had Lucas in his wedding outfit, but having that little blood on his hands. They tend to happen in symbolic places. I mean, that's just a writer's urge to make it as potent and memorable as possible. You're looking for the thing that makes you go, wow. Pauline dying in the middle of the square with the snow and that whole kind of Christmassy kind of feel. Mama! Mama! It felt like it was a fitting kind of iconic end. She's dead. The Vic is always a great place for a murder, for Den, for Archie, because it's such an iconic place. It's funny in EastEnders that most uh, murders happen on Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, wedding days. Valentine's Day, you don't tend to get it on sort of uh, normal Tuesday night. And it was New Year's Eve 2005 that was the setting for one of EastEnders' most tragic murders. Dennis's murder was, was a particularly good one, I thought. The episode and, and the actual murder itself was, was really well done, really beautifully framed and, and, and terribly tragic. Dennis had had a run-in with Johnny Allen. You're a loser, Johnny, and now even your daughter knows it. I pity you. You do anything you like, Rickman. Anything at all. But you don't pity me. What are you going to do about it? And Johnny basically ordered Sharon to 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 get Dennis out of the square. I leave him Morford. I want him out of my sight before the new year. Come midnight, you're gone. Sharon decided the best thing to do was to lie. That she wanted to make a fresh start. She wanted to go to America and they could be happy together. We could take a holiday, couldn't we? We could go and see Vicky. Oh, uh, yes. And even stay there for a while. Karen, I'm not bothered about going to see Vicky. It's just this idea of running away tomorrow. No, this is such a special New Year's Eve. They were, you know, more in love than ever. Sharon was pregnant with their kid, and <sighs> Dennis had that opportunity, had that window to escape. And they were nearly gone, and then Phil arrives. Go ahead, man. No, fine, thanks. I'm about to tell you something. It's going to change everything. Phil told Dennis that Johnny had threatened Sharon and used that information to wind Dennis up and to make him eventually snap. <coughs> what are you doing? It's not nice, is it? Having somebody's hand round your throat. It's even worse when it's your wife's throat. Dennis made the wrong choice, which was to, you know, to go down to Johnny Allen's den and uh, to smash his face into the, you know, the brandy decanter. <laughs> if you really have changed, let it go, leave it, leave it behind. But he couldn't, because he loved Sharon. How do you like it? <laughs> Probably the mistake that Dennis made was he didn't kill Johnny Allen because Johnny found his knife on the street, uh, who uh, then killed poor Dennis. It's a dark night. Everyone around is happy. It's that great thing of like the tragedy happening in the middle of happiness. It's very, very powerful. 
It was New Year, fresh beginnings, new start, and that's exactly what Sharon and Dennis should be having. Dennis lost his life. So you've got the where. Now it's time to look at the why. I think the good motive is absolutely vital to a murder. There's got to be a really clear, kind of definitive reason to end someone's life. I mean, it can't be, you know, that they took your parking space. Owen's death, we built up the antagonism between Lucas and Owen, and Lucas wanted Owen out the way because Owen was going to stop him marrying Denise. So you've got to get the strong motives in. Money's very obvious. I'm broke, I want some cash. You know, somebody gets in the way, they get killed. Tough. And that was the motive for the first ever EastEnders murder back in 1985. It was the very first episode. I kicked the door in, there's Reg Cox. Yes, bloodthirsty viewers were forced to wait a whole 16 seconds before the discovery of murder number one. Oh, stinks in here, doesn't it? <coughs> ain't working. Rich! Well, he ain't gonna answer now if he didn't ask before, is he? Oh, careful, Arthur. Reg Cox. The unluckiest character in the history of soaps. You know, this guy must have, uh, his agent must have said, you're in the BBC's new flagship soap opera. Right. He must have gone out, bought a Mercedes, told all his friends. And, you know, uh, he's just a rotting corpse in a, in a, in a lonely, smelly bedsit. The fact that we started a brand new series with a door being kicked down to find a dead body. He's dead. Dead drunk. No. He's dead. Set the whole tone for the rest of the series, really. There's a rumour, actually, that the producer said, no, it's, it's far too light-hearted, we've got to beef it up a bit, really. And that's what they've done over the years. For three whole years, no-one knew who was behind Reg's death, until... So come on, Nick. Tell me. Tell me what happened. Nick Cotton is a very sort of straightforward style villain. I was hard up. That's what it was all over. Like, short of a few bob. His motivation is always going to be cash, isn't it? And he had a bit of cash. Spotted that when he bought the booze at the off license. Dot spoiled it. Deep down, he's good. But, of course, deep down, he wasn't good, poor Nick. I kicked his head in. There is no redeeming feature about Nick Cotton whatsoever. Having got away with murder once, six years later, Nick is ready for round two. This time, with a habit to feed. There was Nick withdrawing from heroin. I know it's hard, Nick, but you see, it's a bad Nick we've got to say goodbye to. He kept a knife in his sock. He smuggled that into the room when he was, when he was locked in. Desperate for a hit. The person he happened across was Eddie Royal. But it's fair to say his second victim wasn't exactly Mr. Popular. She's lying to protect that slimy toad. All right, that's enough. Now get out. Well, I'll tell you one thing, pal. You don't belong around here, and I'm going to make sure that you don't stay. This is true! Just get out, OK? And this was the last time we saw Mr. Royal alive. And hit. I don't think Nick even thought about who he was or why he, what he was or why he did what he did, but he absolutely punctured him. We'd made the decision very early on that we wouldn't know who the murderer was to begin with. But Nick did the right thing and came clean. Nick tried to frame Clyde Tavernia for it. Oh, right. Yeah. Who was it, Nick? Nick, who was it? Clyde Tavernia. When he was eventually caught for it, he managed to get off. Not guilty. Once again, he got away with murder. Eddie Royal's demise paved the way for a style of murder story that EastEnders has become famous for. EastEnders does the big whodunits really, really well. The bookies are invited to place bets and, and all the actors are sworn to secrecy. 
They do enjoy playing with the mystery of uh, who done it. Guess so. I mean, it all dates back to who shot JR in the early 80s in Dallas. That's got a lot to answer for. So you got any idea who did this? What he does is it opens the whole show up and it brings in the whole cast. And uh, you want to know what's happening to everyone and not just one particular family. There's been, you know, two or three, you know, classic whodunits on EastEnders. <laughs> With the Who Shot Phil, that worked amazingly well, and it got a, a fantastic audience, and people really were hooked on it. But he wasn't murdered. <sighs> right, let's take Who Shot Phil, but let's try and make it even better. So nine years later, EastEnders up the ante with their most explosive whodunit. The ones you like tend to be the ones that get people talking. So Murder of Archie had all the classic ingredients. Here's a character, Archie, who's hated by everyone. He couldn't get any more bad than he was. You've got no style, Jack, no class. What you gonna do, Hey, eh? You gonna beat up an old age pensioner? So the time had come for him to get his comeuppance. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people that had a reason to want him dead, and that's why it's exciting. Oh! Listen, I know what you did. I'm not some cuddly little old lady. You're gonna wish you were dead. Now I know why Frank ran away. If you were my daughter, I'd have run away too. If you died right now, I'd be glad. This face is gonna be the last face you ever see. Do you understand me? You like a drink before you go, Jack? Any one of those people could have done it. And it wasn't until months later on the spectacular live episode that the real killer came clean. <sighs> I did it. I killed Archie. It was me. It wasn't always planned that Stacey was going to be the killer. I, originally, we were talked about who could it be. It was kind of Ronnie, too obvious. Peggy was kind of in the frame because she's got that slight menace about her. But more and more, it just seemed that like Stacy just felt so much. I, I, for me, I just had the image of her in that square saying that. It just felt right. Trails of clues are, are really important because you want that ticking bomb. Wait a minute, wasn't he on CCTV? Fair, pause it. Or didn't so and so pass the window just then and think, well, he's bound to come back at some point. It's part of that jigsaw puzzle. As storytellers, it's important that we that the murderer always leaves a trail of clues. Disposing of the body is a good move for any murderer. Outside your front door, not so good. Burying a body in Albert Square in full view of all those houses was a pretty big clue. There have been several occasions where People or certain animals have got a little bit too close for comfort. Well, we can move that tree. We want it all dug up. Is that your dog trying to get that tree over? Isn't the fun of it that everyone is walking over Owen's body? That's when things start to strip away, the cracks begin to show, the, the control starts to go, the desperation starts to come out. With a community project, a curious dog, and an eight-year-old with an attitude all threatening to expose Lucas's horrific secret, the last few months can be summed up in one facial expression. Well, I'm so worried, babe. And I don't know what to do. It was only a matter of time before he was dug up. Denise knew that Lucas had planted the tree and soon realised the horrifying truth. You'd have seen it. You'd know. It was me. What? It was me that killed Owen. What did you just say? I killed Owen. You're sick! Do you know that? How can you even think that this is even the slightest bit funny? This isn't a joke. Owen was her husband for 15 years, so the, the thought of him being murdered and left to rot under a tree, for Denise, is awful. 
Just when Denise thought things couldn't get any worse, Lucas then reveals Owen wasn't his first victim. Are you telling me that you killed Trina and all? But tries to convince her that he is ready to turn himself in. We're going to the police station for? to tell the truth. What? Denise believes him. That isn't the way to the police station. I know. A decision she would soon regret. A canal? From experience, we know that if Lucas drives you to the canal, you might be in trouble. But don't panic yet, he hasn't mentioned the Bible. I believe the Bible. Oh dear. Things get out of hand at the canal. Do not mock God! This is stupid. Do you submit oh, to his will? He just grabs her and he uses his bare hands. As usual, he's, he finds himself quoting from the Bible as he squeezes the last breath out of her. Anyone arrogant enough to reject the verdict of the judge must be put to death. He's got it wrong. He's got the Bible wrong. It's not that the Bible is wrong, it's just he got it all wrong. Deuteronomy, <laughs> chapter 17. Verse 12. We wanted the audience to think that she's dead. Lucas had committed his worst ever sin, but this murder had a twist. I got a call from the police on Friday. They'd found our car by the canal. And the body in the water. She drowned herself. Had to go and identify the, the body. <laughs> She'd sent a, a text message to the girls earlier saying she was sorry. As far as the police are concerned, it's um, simple. Denise killed Owen. And now herself. A fit of guilt or remorse. Whatever the reason for them, it's over. Case closed. But this case was far from closed. In fact, it was just getting interesting. I bought you some food from the wake. After your funeral. I really hope that there are people all across dropping their dinner on their lap, throwing tea in the air. Denise's survival was one of 2010's biggest soap secrets. The challenge on us as programme makers is to make sure that the secret's kept until that final reveal. I was told uh, about three months ago that we would be led to believe Denise was dead. Often we get paparazzi on location taking pictures of things as filming is happening and often that works against us. In this particular occasion it was really helpful because there was a picture of, of Denise's body allegedly being dragged out of the canal. So we let people believe that. Sometimes for the sake of the story it's worth holding it all back. It's been difficult but but it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Where are we? What? This place. Look, Where is it? Please, just, just sit down for, for a minute. Let's, let's just talk about this, yeah? So, uh, we wanted something a bit different, a twist for the audience, that actually they think Denise is dead, and then, oh, my God, he's, she's in a basement next door. The cell is amazing. It's dank, and it's a bit like, it's a bit like Saw. <laughs> Police! No! <laughs> so go on then. Because you've got Don and Die, you could really, really push them. Kill me. Like you should have done the last time. Let's just get it over with. Yeah? Well, come on! It was very difficult, it was very intense, but we don't have to work at our chemistry. We just have that spark. And it's just a joy to be able to work with someone where they worship you and they hang on everything you say. <laughs> That's done for you. After three weeks in captivity, Denise finally has her chance to get away. Don't leave me. Where are the keys? 
in the door. So? It's not locked. That one person that he fought for and thought was a prize is now walking away and he's got nothing in him left to, to get her to stay. But after all they've been through and seeing Lucas so fragile, could Denise just walk away now? Right, I'm off. Yeah. Then what he realises is there's a little bit of rage left in him that she has gone. Denise may have thought she'd had a lucky escape, but Lucas wasn't done yet, and Libby's birthday party was about to see some fireworks. <laughs> but more on that later. Now, to become a really memorable EastEnders murderer, it's important you pick the right tool for the job. The murder weapon is uh, is absolutely vital. We, we deliberately make sure that the, the murder weapons are iconic. Lucas grabbing his tie becomes a warning for the audience. So they're watching him with his tie, thinking, OK, oh, watch out, he's getting his tie ready. But don't, don't cross him. And God can set you free. No hammer, no knives, no guns, no need. Just him and his tie. And it was a beautiful tie to kill people with. Little Mo originally attempted to murder Trevor with a knife and only the day before filming were we told by our editorial policy people we couldn't use a knife and we went oh no what are we going to do and someone said well like she can just hit him with an iron and we went oh, okay all right <laughs> and of course it worked brilliantly and it worked much better than a knife would have done and it was kind of like a real light bulb moment for me you know, and so like my job now is like, okay, if you're gonna kill Archie, you're not gonna kill him with a gun. You know, you're gonna hit him with something we remember. Nice use of irony there by the writers, uh, and it hasn't gone unnoticed. It's quite fun to play spot the murder weapon. I wouldn't have invited you if I hadn't wanted to spend the time with you. Did you spot that one? Yes, that ashtray is later used to kill Saskia. Oh, Lucas. What about here? Never even kept that message. There's the rake that impales Trina. Easy one here. Shoved behind a whole load of old newspapers. Yes, in that cupboard is the frying pan that kills Pauline. And it's got to be a murder weapon that, that everyone recognises and everyone can talk about. The most bonkers one that actually worked brilliantly was Denon being shot, murdered for the first time, um, with a bunch of daffodils. <laughs> Honestly, it feels slightly laughable now but everybody remembers it but of course it wasn't his only death 16 years later they put a stop to den once and for all on the eastenders they like a knife they enjoy a gun but one of the more memorable murder weapons was uh pauline's doorstop the doggy doorstop doggy doorstop doggy doorstop well this should be really interesting den had destroyed zoe's relationship with dennis stolen the pub from sam and cheated on his wife chrissy in revenge, Chrissy took away the only thing Den cared about, Sharon. I don't know who you are, but you ain't my dad. I'm an orphan. And it was this that led to the famous showdown at the Vic. Oh. Sharon gone. I think it's a really, really powerful and great scene. There's like a, there's, there's a moment, there's an eye contact between Chrissy and Den and then suddenly he just goes for her. <laughs> Zoe picks up the nearest thing to hand, which is Pauline Fowler's doorstop, and just and, and doesn't know what to do, so she just hits him. <laughs> suddenly, Den is dead. Zoe, what did you hit him? I just cracked it! And actually, Chrissy is devastated. You've killed my husband. And then the frightening and, and awful thing happens. You'll never get me out of She hasn't got the other two women there, so she picks up the doorstop again. And to save herself, just smashes him on the head. And then he's dead. And now she's murdered him. Nobody saw her do it. Or did they? That was a great choice of murder weapon. It's full of significance. It's Pauline. Pauline always hated Dan. What's that? Just shows what a witch Pauline Fowler is. Took one look at Betty Turner in the stone. <sighs> You're wicked, you are. One of these days you're going to get struck down. No, not me. I'm indestructible. And it's kind of ironic that he ends up losing his life, being smacked over the head by this very innocuous object. <laughs> there was a time on Easterns when it wasn't very sensible 
to hang out with too many gangsters because, you know, they were, you know, rather prone to killing people. You've got to be very careful who you're going to kill. There's a tradition with these stenters of these bad men that you don't mess with. And make sure they've not got something lurking around the corner that's come, going to come back and bite you. Because you'll end up dead. Yes, mixing with the wrong crowd has led to no less than five EastEnders murders. July 2003, Jack Dalton becomes the first victim of Walford's gangland. But I'm very sorry to hear that. Jack forces Phil to take out Dennis. Who's it? Dennis Rickman. But this backfires when Dennis convinces him not to kill him. You can't do this. If he kills Dalton. I'll kill Dalton. In true gangster style, Dennis marches Jack out to quiet woodland so no one can see him. Apart from that trailload of people. In an attempt to save his life, Jack reveals to Dennis that his father, Den, is actually still alive. That's got to make a difference! It don't. It didn't. Christmas Eve 2004 and the next to fall at the hands of the mob was Paul Truman. Paul grasped Andy Hunter to the police for his shady dealings. I'll grass. So Andy had one of his men take care of him. Hello, Paul. Paul tried to run, but realising his disappearance would only endanger his family, he returned to take it like a man. Well, kind of. In one of EastEnders most civilised demises. Hey, do me a favour, mate. Make it quick. A year later, the hunter becomes the hunted. Andy's luck ran out when he attempted to rip off Johnny Allen. To the tune of three quarters of a million big ones. Three quarters of a million. <laughs> Johnny is not a happy bunny. Let's you and me have a conversation. So they go to settle their differences on a busy flyover. Well, at least we're not somewhere quiet and I will be worried. It's been an education. But Johnny doesn't build bridges, he pushes people off them. Enjoy your flight. In 2005, Johnny Allen is still up to no good and orders the slightly unhinged Danny Moon... You've really hurt my feelings. ...to finish off his arch-enemies, the Mitchell brothers. You really think you're going to get away with this? Well, I have so far, haven't I? He marches them into the woods and takes aim. Fortunately for them, the gunshot comes from Danny's brother, Jake, who kills Danny in an attempt to stop him. I didn't mean to. I just meant to, to hit him in the arm or the, or the leg. Oh, whoops. But the most tragic of all the gangland murders was the violent death of Jace Dyer in 2008. Jace had been involved, you know, quite heavily with uh, a firm like a football hooligans. They know you get your kicks beating the living daylights out of people. And he'd been, uh, you know, doing some quite dodgy, violent things. Jace had discovered that he had a son on the square. Come to be your dad. Well, Fancy that. So Jace was uh, Jace was trying to start again, really, but like all fresh starts, it was destined uh, to go wrong, and his past was destined to catch up with him. After attempting to steal from the head of the firm, Terry Bates, Jace realised that he had been set up, and Terry had in fact kidnapped his son. Jay! Come on, son. Let go of him, all right? Yeah, get back. Get your hands off me, all right? Of all the murders the show has done, it was the most brutal and the most realistic. Come on, there! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on! You want it? And we felt that was right because of the world he lived in <laughs> and the th decisions he made, you know. I mean, there was a kind of element of punishment. You have to portray the reality of it. You know, murder's not funny, it's not fun, it's not uh, fluffy. The thing that gave that murder an extra edge was Billy's Billy's role in it. Please. 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 Don't do it, please. Don't do it. No, don't do it. It was one of the darker moments in the show, but but very purposefully so. <laughs> you know, he did what I think a lot of us would do, which was hide. Where well, I'd just steam in there with a baseball bat and smack him over the head and save him, but, but would you? Or would you save yourself? Would you think about your own kids? It was um, a decision that haunted uh, Billy for a long time. <laughs> there were moments of flashbacks, and for Jace, those, those kind of visions, I suppose, were um, what could have been. Your choice, Jace. 
Any regrets? What could have been, eh? What could have been? You know, the idea around it was just to bring, you know, as much poignancy to the moment as possible. You're the best dad in the world, you know that? <laughs> I think that just kind of helped uh, just give it a bit more tragedy. Back in the present day, the set of the Truman's house is usually a place of happiness. But today, it's the setting for the dramatic climax to Lucas's story. We all got quite excited about this kind of emaciated Denise coming in whilst they're all celebrating and everyone assuming they've seen a ghost. <laughs> so many reveals take place. There's a lot of ground to cover in that one episode. What? I mean, where would we Oh, gorgeous what? You keep her away from me. What happened? Where have you been? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Don't so you sorry. touch me. No, no, please. Go easy. Go easy. <laughs> what would you do if your mum, who you've buried, who you think you've buried, walks into your birthday party? I know. I know. It's hard. I we had your funeral. I cried for you. You're supposed to be dead. <laughs> Both sisters are just feeling completely different things. <laughs> Oh. Diane is just amazing. I almost felt like I didn't even really need to do anything myself just to react to, to what she was giving me. <laughs> I lost you. <laughs> I'm in awe of her every time she does anything. <laughs> no, Libby. No, no. Chelsea, okay, please. Chelsea, I'm alive. This is real. Fortunately, we had a bunch of really good actors in those scenes. I mean, it's a really difficult thing to to emote. You know, your mum coming back from the dead. Stop it! No, she's a But the happy family reunion didn't last very long. You are insane, Lucas! You should be thanking me! Evil, cold-blooded killer! Shut up! No! You don't let her go! Shut up! It's a desperate and, and pathetic last-minute attempt to keep everybody and to keep life the way it was, but it will never be the same again. Don't make this out as though it's normal. Please, this is not People healthy. who tormented us, that threatened to destroy our family, are gone. I have given us a future, don't you see? You think we can still be a family? I have given us an opportunity to start anew. It was really quite intense and moving. It was very draining, emotionally draining. But it was always buzzing with this sort of electricity of, this is going to be quite good. He was my dad! And at the heart of it all is Libby, who discovers that her stepfather, her sister's dad, has killed her dad. She goes absolutely crazy, as you would, knowing that somebody that you'd been living with killed your dad. He left his body to rot in the ground. I didn't even get a chance to say goodbye to him. You tell me what is right about that. You're twisting everything. I don't even remember the last thing I said to him. No, stop. Good on little Libby. I'm cheering as Libby's going for him. Or what, Lucas? Libby, no. Yeah. You're gonna kill me too? There were so many different emotions to go through and, and stunts. That was fun. Do it again. <laughs> yeah. Went again. Oh, God. Oh, God. All right. no, I'm just joking, We're I'm tired. joking. I'm joking, everyone. Come on, relax. <laughs> it was me, Tiana, Belinda, Rudolph and Don, and we all know each other very, very well now. So it, it's that. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. quick for you. Now uh. there. <sighs> well done, everyone. And now. Something like that. The gradual dismantling right up to the point where it just all fell apart has been great. Me, let them go. No, 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 we have to stay together. Dad. He sees his son and he just cannot go on. And that's the end. I'm so sorry. He ends up going to the police and getting taken away. 
and realizing actually that he is a mess, that he has killed these people, he's destroyed all these lives. Do you not say anything that may harm your defense? If you're questioned, something which later on in court. And if you do say, do you understand? And he realizes he is a bad man and needs to be punished. It's going to be really hard for Chelsea and Libby to, to have that connection again because they'll always have that. It'll be like an elephant in the room. It will never be the same again, and that will be sad. Libby and Chelsea find it very hard to live on the square after all of this has happened, and so they move on. Four years solid working with a family and being a family is um, it's a special thing, and I'm really, 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 really going to miss it. So, with Denise left without her husband and her children, can the Fox family ever recover? Well, the foxes will recover. See, everything's all right now. So as those little buds have disappeared and faded, new buds sprout in the form, in the colourful form of Auntie Kim. Auntie Kim is her. So you've got Denise, the sister who's a pain in the arse. You are a disgrace! Sorry, Denise and the sister who's a pain, um, but she loves really. And then there's a baby sister coming along. This is my youngest sister, Daphne. It's a new phase for Denise and her family, which um, will be more positive, and hopefully none of Denise's men will um, come back and kill anyone again. But not all murderers accept their fate so easily. For a murder story to be successful, you have to have... Uh, you have to have a, you know, a big, powerful aftermath. The aftermath, in a way, is more important than the murder itself. The murder by itself is just an incident, you know, and it's a great moment, but, you know, what you want is story. You don't want moments. And Steve Owen's murder of Saskia Duncan was the beginning of one of EastEnders' most gripping aftermath stories. Steve Owen's murder of Saskia was interesting because it was the beginning of his story. Ian, and we know that bloke at the bar. You don't know him? No, I haven't seen him before. Steve was coming out from nowhere. He had moved into the square. He had found a girl in Melanie that he kind of quickly fell in love with. So something big was going to have to come along and disturb all of that, because happiness doesn't last too long in EastEnders. Enter former girlfriend and femme fatale, Saskia Duncan. Maybe he's expected. Just sort of mess up their lives. She was introduced, the character was introduced as this sort of uh, obsessive creature, as it were. The minute you let them get under your skin, it's the end. Steve's got this relationship going with Melanie that he's completely in love with, that he doesn't want to ruin. So Steve is desperate to find a way to get rid of Saskia. Steve Owen, he's not, he wasn't really a villain as such. He was a bit dodgy, maybe. But he wasn't an out-and-out, -out, you know, killer. Well, the murder happened in the E20, in the opening night of the E20, and it was Valentine's night, February the 14th. Now you get back to your club. You're missing your big night. This was meant to be the big, happy occasion, what Steve's been working for, you know. And uh, Saskia turns up, looking for the big row. Hello, Steve. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> the roses really were too much. You know, they're my favourite. What roses? Mel, she's lying. Yeah, of course she is, Steve. And she's mad, I know. Mel, please! They end up in a, in a physical fight. Come on! Come on! A few minutes later, Matthew comes in, catches him in the middle of the fight. Get up! Get up! What are you doing? She knocks Matthew back, he falls over, and uh, she starts to strangle Steve with his own tie. Now, Steve can't do anything else than pick up the nearest object and hits it on the head. The Steve Owen storyline was all about the aftermath. You need a springboard. You need a springboard into a bigger story that can drive stories on for months and years to come. Until that murder happened, there was some debate as to who Steve Owen actually was. Once he'd not gone to the police and kind of bullied Matthew into helping him... All I'm asking you to do is to keep your mouth shut. ..then you knew exactly who that character was. Come pass that stuff over here. Things got out of control. And I think it was a turning point for the character, because suddenly he had to become a, a different person. Come on! He had to survive. And the only way to survive was, you know, move, move the guilt away from himself. You just helped me wrap up the body. I think for the law, you're going to need an alibi. The best part of that whole Saskia murder story was that Steve decided for them to both bury her in the woods. That bullet, the cover it with some leaves. Don't go to the police, bury her in the woods. It's going to take me a while to identify the body, Nadja. Let's just get on with it, shall we? You were watching that 
to find out if they were going to get caught, you were watching Steve's manipulation of Matthew. You just remember one thing. If I go down, I'm taking you with me. A few weeks after, uh, the body is found in the woods by a, a young kid and a court case pursues. If the defendants would please rise. In terms of drama, it's very important to have, you know, a potential innocent accused. As an audience, if we know who's done it and we see someone that we love bang to rights, then we're screaming at the TV saying, no, it's not them, it's them. In respect of Stephen Owen on the count of murder. Was Steve going to go down for murder? Did I ever think that? No, I didn't. Not guilty. I always knew he was going to get off. <laughs> In respect of Matthew Rose, on the count of manslaughter. A really good murder will spread out over six months. I think the aftermath is crucial. You know, it can be incredibly powerful and serious and, uh, and haunting. Guilty. You know, the more those stories tentacles go out, then the stronger the story is. And a murder is a classic case. He's innocent! My son is innocent! That is pure EastEnders at its best. So how did Paul Matthew get sent down while Steve got away scot-free? One reason alone, the Walford Constabulary. OK, well, let's talk about the police in Walford. What police? Their ineptness at times is, is, is staggering. The police do get everything wrong. We're looking at a potential murder inquiry, Mrs. Weeks. I don't even believe this. Wolford is filled with the rejects. Oh, this is stupid. <laughs> of, uh, the detective school. <laughs> D.I. Banks, in the presence of D.S. Marsh, interview room one, Wolford Police Station. Chances are, if you're bright enough, you can get away with it. If this is your case against me, then quite frankly, officer, you don't have a case. I think a slightly inept, bumbling cop is quite handy when it comes to, to EastEnders murders. You have to identify something. If they were Cracker, if they were uh, Morse, they'd probably work it out quite quickly. <laughs> what should we be looking at here, then? A great example here. Matthew goes to identify his stolen property. Is it a comedy? Murder mystery? Almost. It's CCTV footage of an actual murder. So these must belong to you, then? Probably not a good idea to turn the screen round at this point. Look, look, you're missing the murder. Well done, now. Of course you can, Mr Rose. We could make the Wolford Police fantastic and have the crime solved in two days. Miss Mitchell! But there'd be no point in doing a murder storyline. Taking a while to find their killer <laughs> is, is par for the course, yeah? You might want to inform a solicitor. No, no. You've got to keep the drama going. You want to use the police as a threat to the murderer, oh, God, yeah. but also have people wrongly arrested. <laughs> Wasn't me Not being held on suspicion of murder. Wasn't me. Grant, Anthony Mitchell, I am arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Edward Royal. Wasn't me. Janine Evans, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Laura Beale. Wasn't me. Donny Jackson, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of Edward Fanny. It's you. Wasn't me. The police, they are a bit lackadaisical at times. To get a conviction, you've virtually got to say, I did it. I think the last line is really important, but it can get a little bit cheesy. I may not be the first woman in your life dead, but I'm definitely going to be the last. What you're looking for is that phrase that people will go to work and repeat the next day or go to school and repeat the next day. Enjoy your flight. Last lines sometimes can be a little bit kind of camp and arch, but just raise it above the norm, such as Janine's last line. If you're going to leave EastEnders, you might as well go out with a bang. The boss called me up and he said, Sean, the time has come, you know, we, we need a death. So, yeah, they, they come up with this idea of, of getting rid of Barry by having Janine push him off a cliff. They said, don't worry, it'll be a cliffhanger. But unfortunately for Barry, there was no way back from this. The most watched murder in EastEnders history with over 18 million viewers. Barry was in a really bad way in his life, and Janine was this route to a kind of happier life. Janine saw this opportunity, saw this weakness. Fleecing Barry for all the money he had. And you go and buy yourself a new dress, and we'll do lunch in style, yeah? Janine thought that he had a heart condition, didn't have much longer. I want his money, and that is it. Marry me, I won't be around long. Three months tops, and it's all yours. The house, <coughs> deals on wheels. <laughs> it's all yours. Hello, you. We went all the way up to Scotland at a place called The Rest and Be Thankful. Please join me in a toast to my new wife, Janine Evans. He thought he was dying, but Barry being Barry... 
I got the wrong end of the stick. <laughs> what do you mean? It turned out that he didn't actually have weeks to live. He had many, many decades to live. And he tells her, bless him. Happy New Year, Mrs. Evans. Janine was just mortified and thought, how am I going to spend the rest of my life with you? Him cuddling up to her, kissing her neck. I've got a headache. Repulsed to the point of madness, really. She just, oh, she can't bear that she just pops and has to tell him this silly man that, of course, she's never been in love with him. None of this is real. You do know that, didn't you? Well, come on, say something. Charlie Brooks is such a good actress that when she was coming out with this, with this vile, insulting tirade against me, you know, I, I did, I genuinely cried and, and you know, I, I really got into the moment. When I was on the game, right, oh, I did some iffy things, but of all the filth I have had to enjoy for money, being with you was by far the foulest. That was one of the nicer phrases that she used. You're a mug. I, don't, I just don't think the writer liked me. Oh, really? You said some terrible things about me via Janine. You're the same doormat you've always been. They were halfway up a mountain. There were no witnesses. And this was a great opportunity to do him in. Oh, me! <laughs> His head hit the only rock. I mean, it's only rock for miles. I think it's really worth thinking about the final line of a character as they die. I mean, there's no point them saying, I don't want to die. Try and make that line tragic, really, and for us to miss that character. His last words, I think, were Jack, because he was thinking about his son. Jack. He's really sad. I'm welling up as I'm talking about She kind of utters the immortal line. Memories are better. I.e., you'd have been about that much use as a dad anyway. Final lines to a, a dying man go, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cold, it's pretty evil. And then later on, of course, she, she, she bent down and undid Barry's shoelaces. Leaving him at the bottom of the cliff, <laughs> you know, seeing him there and then just walking off. I think that's where you see pure evil in Janine. And it spoke volumes about where Janine was at at that time and who she was. It moved her villainy on one notch more. But it wasn't just her villainy that had moved on a notch, it was her one-liners too. Probably the most memorable lines in, in Aftermath terms is Janine's. What was that classic line I had in one of the episodes afterwards? If only he'd worn slip-on shoes. If only he'd worn slip-on shoes. Everyone remembers slip-on shoes. Do you remember that scene? Janine and the slip-on shoes. Um... If only he'd worn slip-on shoes! Everyone remembers it. If only I'd worn slip-on shoes! <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Six years later, people still talk about the murder and, and Janine. But as far as I'm concerned, it's better to be known than unknown. I phoned home recently and my daughter answered the phone. I said, Sophie, it's Daddy. She said, who? I said, Daddy. She said, who? I said, it's Barry from EastEnders. She said, why don't you say so? I'll go and get Mum. Janine was never convicted for the murder of Barry, but in true EastEnders style, justice caught up with her when she was framed for the murder of Laura Beale. I didn't do it! Proving that no evil deed goes unpunished, and in Walford, what goes around comes around. <laughs> In EastEnders rules, the killer must always get their comeuppance. It may not happen immediately, but it will happen eventually. Nick Cotton escaped prison for the murders of Reg Cox and Eddie Royal, but in 2001, he was responsible for the death of his own son, Ashley. Steve Owen was never convicted for killing Saskia or framing Matthew Rose. However, when Matthew was released from prison, he returned to torture Steve. Then, in 2002, Steve was blown up. Johnny confessed his part in multiple murders and was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2006, he died of a heart attack. After attempting to frame both Zoe and Sam for Den's murder, Chrissy is eventually found out. She pleads guilty and is sentenced to life imprisonment. Terry Bates was jailed for the murder of Jace Dyer. His wife then filed for divorce. Stacy is yet to be brought to justice for the murder of Archie Mitchell. But after one day of marriage, her husband Bradley tragically died. And you can all sleep soundly tonight as Wolford's most dangerous man is safely behind bars. Lucas's final scene in the show is quite heartbreaking, actually. Something that was etched into the wall. 
a, a crucifix with a quote on it. And he, he just tries to just rub it all away. Before you know it, his fingers are bloody white. He tries to chip away at the wall. He finds blood on his hands and he writes sorry in blood. It's a very sad, but also I think quite a beautiful end to, uh, to Lucas as we know it. And I will die alone and be left there. Well, I guess I'll just go home. He hands over his Bible to the prison warder, says something like, he won't be needing that where he's going, and, uh, and says a very simple final word. Amen. That's Don's last shot, everyone. Oh, yeah. So after two and a half years, Don's time on the square comes to an end. Thank you on behalf of EastEnders. You'd be the nicest serial killer EastEnders has ever had. Oh. And thanks for, for playing an amazing part, so thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. It's all a group effort to make this happen, and it's been great. As long as I haven't upset you over the last two and a half years, you've given me joy, so it's been great. So this is, this is just thank you to all of you, and I love you all. Thank you. Oh. Now, I'd just like to uh, go to the toilet, if that's right. <laughs> If you're going to do a, a best bits montage uh, of all the, you know, all the killings and all those moments and things like that, you've got to get some good music behind it, yeah? Uh, I'm not, obviously not telling you what to do, but you, know, you can get things like Smooth Criminal, you know, um, nobody does it better. Nobody does it better. He's a real joker. No one's got a bad word to say about him. I've enjoyed the whole experience of Don. We're two peas in the pod, really. If enough people say, yeah, he was all right to work with, he, he did his bit, then that's all, I, that's all I want. He's a lovely guy, you know, he's an absolute sweetheart and he works like a Trojan. I think Don's been amazing. Everyone's gutted that he's going because he's an amazing actor and a lovely man. I'll miss it, definitely. Definitely. Oh. The Lucas Air return, and never say never. It's been grand. Can you turn this off now? Yeah. I've stopped all that final stuff. It's over. Yeah. I want my car. Where's my car? Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to get a car to take you when you're dressed up like that, though, Don. Up next, late tonight on BBC Three, it's Alice, and which of her six dads is going to walk her up the aisle? I didn't want to make a big song and dance about it anyway. A new series of Ideal coming soon on BBC Three. He's shipped the deeper and they could be about to knock out one of the biggest teams. There's a chance. It's in the penalty. It's in the net. What a goal. What a technical goal. Oh, my goodness. What a fantastic strike from 30 yards out. Bigger steps, bigger steps. Hits the free kick. Straight into the net. Celebrate another great season with unrivaled coverage from BBC Radio 5 Live. Three. She's dreamt of this moment her entire life. But with the groom in charge of planning her big day... Not worth laughing about, is it? She's yeah. gonna kill me. You look really nice. Do I? This is hell on earth. It's got the pint, it's got the pint. <laughs> Will there be a honeymoon in heaven? Oh, I love that. I do feel like a princess. Or a cold shoulder in hell? I don't think it'd be that. I need the shoes now. I'm really struggling to want to marry you. Don't tell the bride. Coming soon to BBC Three. Two programmes from BBC Three's adult season now. Alice and her six dads is first. And next, a girl called Chloe. And one big hurdle for her to overcome in Baby Beauty Queens.